side and now let's see, now it's time for the attorneys to present to you their final arguments in the case of what's that? Your, it's your final argument. So yes, I don't know where my head's at right now. <laughs> Excuse me, let me start over again. I almost got it backwards. Uh, this is now we've finished all the testimony and the evidence in the case. It's time for the attorneys to give to you their final arguments and tell you what they think that the evidence and law uh, require you to do as far as your verdict is concerned, what a proper verdict would be. Since the plaintiff has the burden of proof in this, they have the right to have their time divided up uh, to a pro uh, between opening and a rebuttal argument. And the defense is in the middle. Both sides have approximately 45 minutes to give you their arguments. And as I said, it's divided up 30 minutes. 45 minutes and 15 minutes. With that said, thank you, Rock. May I please support counsel? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. This is a very important case because it stands for being paid for the services that you provide, being fairly compensated for services you provide. Uh, this is a case about quality health care, uh, and it really stands for that because. The evidence in this case has been very, very clear that if insurance companies do not pay doctors for the medical services that they provide, the patients will suffer. Quality health care workers will go down the tubes, doctors will leave the state of Florida, and will see places that fairly compensate them for the services that they provide. And it makes absolute sense. So this case is very, very important to these particular doctors, and it's very important to health care in the state of Florida. This is a case where the defendant has drawn the line, and with all due respect to the men and women in our military that are fighting wars and getting shot, I will use a, a military term, but I mean no disrespect. Uh, the battle lines were drawn. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield made a quote-unquote business decision to stop paying the professional component of clinical pathology, and they decided no matter what, they are going to not pay it, uh, no matter how much doctors would scream, no matter how much the, the doctors would say how important it was, they just weren't going to pay. Uh, and they were going to go the distance on the issue. So the battle lines were drawn, and that is why we are here in this courtroom. Because with your decision, you're going to be deciding the value of the services that these doctors provided. Uh, and the court is going to instruct you, uh, as we told you in the very beginning of the case, that this was a case that involved questions of law for the court, and questions of fact for you, the jury. The court has determined, he will instruct you as a matter of law, that based on the contracts the defendant had with its patient subscribers, the members, and based on Florida statutory law that covers it and dominates and controls this case, uh, the defendant is legally responsible, legally required to pay the doctors for the medical services they provided in the professional component of clinical pathology. The court has already ruled that. You will, will be instructed on that. So the issue for your determination today will be what is the reasonable value of those services. Now, the first uh, thing that I want to do is thank you very much for all of your attention. You've been very attentive all week, uh, and I know that a lot of the testimony has been very complicated and um, sometimes a little boring, which we do apologize for. Uh, but you've been very attentive, and you've been very interested in this, and on behalf of everyone in this courtroom, we thank you. Abraham Lincoln once said that the greatest service that anyone can provide during peacetime um, is serving on a jury, because it's so important to why we have what we have, to our freedoms, to the ability to receive fair justice. Uh, because bottom line is, if, if we didn't have a civil justice system, if we didn't have a court system with jurors, and people have disputes. What do they do? They argue to the blue in the face. Uh, people would get into fights, and it, it would be a very ugly scene. But here, in a very civilized fashion, sometimes he, he did debate, but a very civilized fashion, we come before the court when we feel injustices have been thrust upon us to seek equity, to seek balance, to seek fairness, to, to seek justice. And that's why this is such an important court. And it, it's not important what your name is, your last name, uh, what color your skin is. It had, justice is blind. And that is why uh, this group of four pathologists uh, can stand up today, proudly, and face Blue Cross Blue Shield and say, you're wrong. What you did was wrong. You're hurting health care. 
and they have an equal shot taken on the insurance company as anyone else in this courtroom. It balances it out. It, it's, it's, it's where true justice can occur. Now, we heard about the, the standard proof. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's how you decide a case. What's the proof that's required? In a criminal case, the court used the uh, scale of justice in the beginning, and uh, I'll go ahead and borrow that, because I think it's very effective. In a criminal case, it's beyond and to the exclusion of a reasonable doubt. That means you have to tilt the scales that much, beyond and to the exclusion of a reasonable doubt. Because what it means is that somebody may go to jail if they were found guilty. So they're presumed innocent until proven guilty, and it has to be proven beyond and to the exclusion of a reasonable doubt, that part. In a civil case, it's different because it's for money damages. Um, and in civil, we can't put anybody in jail. We can't pull away any insurance company's license to practice in Florida. All we can do is award damages when they do something that's inappropriate, or if they owe money, they're required to pay the money. And the standard for that is called greater weight of the evidence. If I'm scale of justice again, greater weight of the evidence means you tilt the scale just a bit. That's it greater weight of the evidence. It's the difference between 51 and 49, greater weight of the evidence. It doesn't sound like a lot, but if you consider it, it uh, was enough to decide the presidential race between Gore and, and Bush the first time. It was probably less than 1%, uh, and, it, and it's enough in a civil case. Another way to look at it is that if it were a basketball game, the Heat is not about to go to the playoffs now with the Chicago Bulls, and uh, the score is tied at the very end, you know, last second, High score and Dwayne Wade runs down, passes it to Shaq, Shaq comes in, dunks it, boom, and the Heat wins by one point, greater right weight of the evidence. That's what it is, greater right weight of the evidence. It's also defined in the jury instructions, you'll hear, that it's the more persuasive strength of the case, in essence, what you find to be more persuasive. Another way to look at it is uh, it's probably correct. That's probably right. So if that's the standard, that's greater right weight of the evidence. So what brought us here? Why are we here? Why, why did this case come about? It came about because in 1998, the defendant decided that they weren't going to pay the professional component of clinical pathology anymore. They weren't going to do it. They said, we're going to save $4.1 million by doing that. We're just not going to pay the doctors anymore. Uh, and the, the argument that they made, ultimately, remember, because we're going to go over some of the documents just so we can have a historical perspective as to what's fair and reasonable for the plaintiff in this case. So we, let's look at historically how we got there. Uh, they said, well, how are we going to do it? And then one idea was, well, we're going to get, uh, we'll, we'll make agreements with the hospitals. Remember, they're, they're an HMO. And the way it is, the patient has an insurance policy, and they get the HMO, they, have, they sign up with Blue Cross Blue Shield. Then Blue Cross Blue Shield has contracts with different hospitals, so that those patients can go to those hospitals. And then those hospitals have certain doctors who work in those hospitals, like pathologists, that in this case do not have direct contracts with Blue Cross Blue Shield. So Blue Cross Blue Shield had contracts with certain hospitals. And what they were thinking about doing in 1998, several months, um, and, and sometimes a year, several months before they implemented this policy, not paying the doctors anymore, said, well, we're going to put language in the agreements with the hospitals that say we're, that we are paying the hospitals the money for the professional component of clinical pathology. And we're going to require language in those contracts that will specifically state in the contract, you know, hospital, we're paying you additional money, and you are responsible for paying the professional component of clinical pathology to the doctors. They talked about that. They also talked about, well, whatever we have to pay these doctors because they're called non-par, that's not a golfing term. It means non-participating. It means they don't have a direct contract with the defendant. We'll pay whatever we normally pay the doctors their non-par rate. We're going to pay, if this is the hospital, we're going to pay the hospital that exact same amount. And then we're going to put that in the contract. And the hospital will be, will be responsible for paying the doctors. Then they decide, well, that's not going to save us any money, Blue Cross Blue Shield. It won't save us any money at all. Because in that case, what they do is they take the money